find out what kind of community it was. And most of the people we asked told us it was a community trying very hard to improve itself. It's beautiful because of the, the very dynamics of the community. It is a, a community that's, uh, that's dedicated to its own self-improvement. One good thing that I like about living in Waimanalo is that uh, we're all able to harmonize and, and work for, I'm hoping and I'm hoping that this is true, and we're working for one common goal in Waimanalo, and that's to be a united community. Looking around Waimanalo, it's hard to tell what needs to be improved. This is a special place, once the playground of the Ali'i, and now a valley still owned almost entirely by the state. The many small communities found within Waimanalo itself are a result of state ownership and various master plans which have created different neighborhoods with different needs. This used to be a plantation town, and when the sugar company closed, the plantation village remained. The sugar fields became farm lots. A large Hawaiian homestead area has been settled. A chunk of beach property sold for homes. And recently, the state has subsidized a couple of new housing developments here. Because the state owned it, the state made the planning decisions. The separate parts of the community didn't really come together until the threat of a commercial airport at Bellows Field united all of Waimanalo in a successful effort to stop the airport. They discovered that their political voice is a lot stronger as a unified community. And when they say they're working to improve their community, we think they mean to identify with Waimanalo instead of just their own part of town. Community worker, Rose Lani. I never thought I would see a community so divided like we were five years ago. We didn't know there was a village homes association down the street. Everybody was all quietly in their own little catch, and when you finally got out to a meeting, it was just about 45 minutes to an hour, and everybody says goodbye. We're complete strangers. But because of it, it intrigued me, because as a resident of Paula, I saw more happenings out there from their senators, their representatives, and here is Wyman all with all the representatives and senators they had on this area, they had nothing. This is what I intrigued me. They had no thought of a community library. There was no multi-purpose buildings that they were talking about. If they did, there was a small group and nobody really worked together. Everybody was apart. That's why I say to me, five years later, I guess I'm glad I was here in that last five years because now I can see there are rewards. We've got a library going up. We've got multi-purpose gym that's going to be going up. There are... Look around your community. Five years is a lot of new things uh, are here. This part of town is called the village. These are the original homes of the plantation workers. When the plant closed in 1947, most of the 350 tenants stayed on extended leases. A few years later, the territory announced that a federal law entitled them to purchase their house lots. Most of them applied for purchase, but nothing was done. Then, Hawaii became a state. The law that would have allowed them to buy their homes was revoked. State plans for redevelopment of the village area meant that the villagers would have to move. The state offered lots in the core area of Waimanalo to those who could afford them. When the residents objected to the price, the state lowered the price from $1.15 to $0.85 cents a square foot. These were the 1956 land values, the year in which the residents were led to believe they could purchase their village lots. About 60 families did move from the village to the core area. Some wanted to stay in the village, but they were told that the core area would be filled by outsiders if they didn't go. Andrew Jamila is one of those who did move. It is a kind of a complex thing which I've, I've uh, you know, searched my soul for every now and then, but. Uh, but as times times changes and people think differently after a while, like we were brought up uh, to adhere to the old adage of uh, you know you'll pay what the authorities tell you to do. It's either yes, and uh, so you found it on a kind of a foundation where people come up and the authorities tell you you have to move, you got to go. Andrew's neighbor, Mr. Oligaro, also moved away from the village at the same time. If the government didn't. Uh, 
put their hands on us, I would say, yes, the life is so wonderful, I would say, because uh, the fact that people are so friendly, they gardens in the backyard is so wonderful that you cannot resist in doing th such things because it's kind of community life. Uh, whatever you need, whenever you need a hand, those people are always with you. Those who continued to stay in the village received eviction notices from the state in 1972. They organized, demonstrated, and won a settlement which enabled them to stay where they were with a 65-year lease to back them up. Irene Legronio works for the Waimanalo Residence Housing Corporation. And the state wanted us to incorporate. They gave us this land for a dollar a year, lease land, you know. And uh, we're going into our own housing development right now. And uh, we're very much to the day where, you know, we're going to start groundbreaking. And this is going to be somewhere in September to we'll start our housing. Many of the people that do live here are the elderly, you know, people that are getting Social Security. And many of them cannot afford um, the core development. And even if they do live in Banyan Tree, it's just a whole new way of life for them. And they're so used to living this kind of lifestyle, having their own vegetable gardens, their chickens to mess around with, and even their other animals. Where in the Banyan Tree, you can take them with you, you know. Judy Spencer is the new president of the Village Housing Corporation. For myself, I was pretty scared at that, you know, during that period. And I had mixed emotions myself about moving out or really staying to fight and, you know, wondering if we really could, you know, win. Well, we had ethnic students, study students come in, and they helped convince me. You know, we had gone over to the townhouses and inspected, you know, the homes that they were putting up. And the materials that they were using were very cheap, and this was all brought forth to us, you know, by ethnic studies. And um, everybody could see, you know, say about in 20 years what's going to become of the townhouses. So we stayed. Uh, I see, uh, if, if it was 10 years later, with a lot of people, with the pressure, with the economic pressure as it is, then, you know, uh, moving down you, and uh, when you find out you have to go out and pay rent to uh, three or four times of what you normally were paying there, I would have taken the active stand along with them, and I would have, uh, I would have, I would have stayed there. I would have, I would have fought and say, no way you're going to get me out of here. The same way like people in uh, uh, White County, Kahole, uh, the White County area, the uh, Chinatown area, because all these people, as they get, as they get noticed to evict, they realize that they can't, they can't move from anywhere else without having to pay two, two or three times more than what they are paying today. You isolated from the village. Uh, this is evident when you go down past the village. You see a whole bunch of kids all playing together. You know, a group like either volleyball or uh, right alongside uh, the uh, roads where they were, where they're going to build the uh, fire station. Uh, the kids are always playing. Uh, they come from you know from homes all within the within the campsite. But they don't have this here, uh, maybe primarily because it's, uh, it's a kind of, uh, the atmosphere is a little different here. You, you know, you've got the right of uh, paved road and everything else, but you have, you, uh, you have that closeness over there. People grow up close together. Some of the new house lots will be smaller than they are now. Some of the backyard gardens and animals will have to be relocated to a community agricultural area. The residents fought to stay in order to preserve their lifestyle. A few are beginning to wonder whether this will still be possible. All the building going on won't be in the village. These are homes being replaced by the Hawaiian Homes Department, and the tents are temporary homes for the families until construction is complete. Waimanalo has 129 acres still to be developed by Hawaiian Homes Lands, but construction has been slow. The drainage project should prevent flooding and more homes can then be built. But even with homes on all 129 acres, many of the 1,900 people on the waiting list for Waimanalo will still be waiting. Hawaiian Homes Commission Chairman Billy Beamer. In Waimanalo, we had 46 homes in the housing package. Generally, for a contractor, it takes 120 days for the first 20 homes to be completed. And then thereafter, uh, 20 homes for every 30 days. 
each month you have a turnover another 30. Uh, so the time for completion varies depending on the, uh, the number in the package and whether your home was uh, first to be constructed or not. We expect in Waimanalo to turn over the first uh, 12 homes the beginning of July that will be completed and then they will be, will be turning them over on a regular basis thereafter. They should all be completed uh, by September. Have you or any of your family had any um, trouble with replacement housing? Do you have to wait a long time or what? Yes, I, I have two brothers that they're building their home right now and it's been so long they're still waiting and taking them I have a long time to finish it. I don't know why. <laughs> well, how, where are they living right now? Uh, temporarily there, with one with the daughter, and one to build a little shack right next to the home. And how long has it taken? Well, uh, it's been since February, and it's still not finished yet. And I hope it'll be sooner than they expected. I think it's going to be finished by Christmas. <laughs> Blanche Pope School is surrounded by homestead land and receives funds from Hawaiian Homes Revenues for cultural programs at the school. Waimanalo School serves kids from other parts of town, and its intermediate school is for all the Waimanalo kids. But here, there are no such cultural programs, and some parents think there should be. That money is not administered by this department. Again, by legislative act, part of the money that normally should come to the department for the development of land was appropriated to the Department of Education for the purpose of educating the Hawaiian child on homestead land. I resent this. Uh, if Hawaiian culture is important, then there are children who are off Hawaiian homelands who need that same type of exposure. Therefore, it is a state responsibility and not the responsibility of this department to provide money for the education of all of the Hawaiian children, and not only Hawaiian children, of every child in Hawaii who should have that type of cultural exposure. We, in the past 10 years, have put aside three and a half million dollars for the education of the homestead child that is expended by the Department of Education. We tried to change this in this legislative session, but it's like motherhood. Uh, we lost again because this program is managed by a homestead group, an advisory committee. The department has nothing to do with it. It's just money that should be earmarked for this department that is diverted to the Department of Education. I concur. Uh, if the program is being offered at uh, Pope, and there is a high concentration of uh, Hawaiians living, residing in the Waimanalo area, then the identical program should be offered in Waimanalo school. If they're going to get a group together to lobby, I will volunteer to testify. <laughs> when Governor Ariyoshi overturned the Hawaiian Homes Commission order to evict a homestead family who had been delinquent in meeting their mortgage payments, Billy Beamer and the entire Hawaiian Homes Commission threatened to resign. Most of the Hawaiian people, most of the people uh, who have responded or reacted to that uh, article in the paper or the decision of the commission have reacted positively. We have had a few negative responses uh, that it is the responsibility of the department to carry uh, these people. Please understand that we have only moved for eviction when the individuals have the ability to pay and have, have elected to use their money for other, uh, for luxuries or amenities for themselves. Those who do not have income, who are delinquent, we have uh, referred them to welfare. We must make this move, and the endorsement has come from homesteaders as well as others, uh, just private citizens. Uh, the endorsement has come because what's good for one is good for all. Now, if we are not going to collect from someone who has the ability to pay, then we should not collect from everyone. Everyone should have the option 
to come on to Hawaiian homelands and use that money for something else. As residential development expands in Waimanalo, it comes closer and closer to the farmlands. Whether residential and agricultural endeavors can coexist is a problem everywhere, but here in Waimanalo, an additional problem is added. About 500 acres of this farmland was sold in nine-acre parcels in 1965 for $1,200 an acre as part of Governor Quinn's second Mahele. The low price, coupled with the restriction that the land be used only for agriculture for 25 years, was meant to make farming both available and worthwhile. For many farmers, the 25-year restrictions will expire in 1980, leaving them free to sell their land, which can be used for anything which conforms to the zoning. The farmers who lease nearby land from the state, as well as the community at large, are uneasy about the possible outcomes of allowing the farmers to sell. Some farmers have reportedly received offers of $40,000 an acre for their land. Fee simple farmer, Hisashi Akagi, or when you're thinking of selling it, now if you have a choice, sell it to somebody who might want to, to build homes on it eventually, or sell it to the state for an agricultural park, which of those would you do? You see, when a buyer, like the state, say they want to keep them for agriculture, we know the value of the land, <coughs> what their idea of what it's going to cost them is way, way below what we can get. To us, it doesn't make a difference whether it's going to be agricultural land, it's going to be for any, any other use, provided we have what they call a fair and beautiful land. So you wouldn't say that you're being selfish now, thinking of selling your land to somebody who doesn't want to farm it? say that who's going to sell to who? We don't know. I, I, like myself, uh, sometimes I don't like uh, my neighbors, you see. But the owner sold them to I don't know. When you live, you don't, you don't think too much about who the people that are not going to do about it. We don't know. <laughs> if you know, you can tell me. <laughs> so you don't think you're being selfish? People, uh, they, they may say they, they're not selfish, but uh, <coughs> way deep inside, they, they have that feeling. Look for your own too. I don't care. I, I'm honest with you. Many of the fee simple farmers are ready to retire. They say they need to sell their land in order to provide a retirement income for themselves. They say their children are grown and do not wish to continue farming. Some of them say that Waimanalo lands are not good farmlands. Rodney Fukui provides a leasehold farmer's perspective to these problems. They can sell it. That's their right, and uh, there's no way I, I can stop them from selling. But the problem here is not whether they sell or not. The problem right now is they want to urbanize Waimanalo so they can get the maximum returns. In other words, what they are uh, land that they paid ten thousand dollars for they're asking for a million dollars today. And I mean literally a million dollars. Because if you add it up, what, what they want per square foot, it will come up to a million dollars when you own nine, ten acres of land. I say to them, if your children are not interested in farming, why not make it available to other people's children who want to farm and cannot find land anywhere? But why should a few people who work hard for 25 years be entitled to a good retirement? What about the rest of us? I work hard for 12 years now, and, and by the time my land is, by the time I work for 25 years, all I wind up with is just a land that reverts back to the state. We have here in Wamanala people doing all kinds of farming for a living. Give example, we have dairy farming here, we have truck crop farming, we have chicken farms, we have flower, orchids and tulip uh, farmers, we have potted plants farmers, we have uh, uh, farmers who uh, uh, export plants. We have dog kennel, we have hydroponic farming, we have stable for horses, and we have all kinds of other farming activity going on. Warren Yi has a leasehold nursery operation. If it's going to be turned into a subdivisions, then that will affect our type of operation here. Uh, it will not be that compatible 
uh, with a nursery operation uh, adjacent to a residential area. How will it be incompatible? Well, basically, like nursery operation, we have to spray. We spray herbicides, insecticides, fungicides. So you have uh, some uh, odor, um, which, of course, you know, if the residential area is adjacent to it, you know, they, they will complain. And it has happened in, in other areas where uh, agriculture was there first, and then residential areas slowly crept up, you know, surrounding the area. So it, it is a, a constant uh, problem. Terrell Takashida leases two acres of land from a fee simple farmer. I spent a whole year looking for land. Haiku and some of the other plantations, which uh, came about beautiful large subdivisions, one acre lots. If you look under the multiple listing books, it's under ag. But you try to buy a property and try to put up a greenhouse, they'll stop you right away. And it's not the state or the city, it's the association. People don't want to have their uh, subdivision so far cluttered. Well, I think it's all wrong. Well, I, I feel that Wamanalu, that would be the best answer for Wamanalu to, to make it into an ag park. And then the, for those who claim that the land is bad, who wants to sell, let them sell. And uh, let them get a fair price. Uh, what they can do is have a bunch of appraisers come by and appraise the land for farming, for farming now, not for development, but for farming, and, and let them get a fair price for farming. State Representative Jan Yuen. I feel that when these people acquired these properties, it was on the basis that they would maintain agricultural activity on the land. Even though they, ha they now own it in fee, I, I think that's part of the, the condition for ownership of the land. So even though this may be a, an unpopular stance, so I think they should continue to maintain agricultural activity on the uh, fee simple land. Waimanala is considered a viable site you know, for maintaining agricultural activities. In fact, uh, it is considering, uh, well, the um, director of agriculture is considering Waimanala as a possible site for an agriculture park. And in order to do that, uh, all those people who own the fee simple lots will have to make that kind of a commitment. John Farias, chairman of the State Department of Agriculture. But it takes a powerful lot of work uh, to put together this type of arrangement when you have people owning the land and wanting to do with it uh, what, what they might, no matter what they feel about that, about agriculture. It's an uh, extremely difficult process when you're at this end of the road when the decisions, in effect, were made 25 years ago, uh, the, the so-called Second Mahili, uh, 25 years ago, was the, uh, the greatest move to urbanize Waimanalo that I've seen 25 years hence. And this is what we're seeing now. Uh, so what we're seeing, and that's why the Ag Park uh, law is so effective, that this type of uh, law can help preserve ag lands and ag water uh, for many years down the pike. Since you have been a farmer for so long, and, and I know that you probably do um, place a lot of value on working with the land and raising things and so forth, would you like to see Waimanalo remain an agricultural community um, you know, for the future? Have Waimanalo be an agricultural community? Have the state and private interests invest in agriculture here? repeat over and over again, eh? my days are over, but to the young guys, <coughs> we cannot tie them up and say, hey, you got to be this this way for you first, you know, forever. I, I cannot say that. Mm -hmm. Because uh, time changes, people change, anything change, and they can change too. Do you think the people generally in Waimanalo would like to see it remain in agriculture? Well, you say uh, uh, people generally in Waimanalo, now, how many of them is effective? Right now, uh, the fish simple landowners here is really a small minority. And uh, being a minority, how can you say that we can get certain things right now? We, we have to have an uh, understanding and probably sympathy from the rest of Waimanalo. Diane Isaias, Chairman of the Waimanalo Joint Planning Committee. One of the things that we have done over the past year and a half is is to discuss this and talk about it and get it out in the open so that the people here know about it and we understand it and um, I think this is one of the big um, issues where we can come up 
with new kinds of approaches or new ideas, you know, experiment to a degree. Uh, and that is that, um, you know, look into other things that you could do with the land. And this is what we've been doing in the planning committee is really talking about this. And, and you know, most of us on the committee feel we have not got the right to tell that farmer what he can do with his land. I mean, he owns it. He has the right to, to do something with it so that he can come up with a, a decent retirement and this kind of thing, you know, be able to leave something to his children, whatever. And I really sympathize with those people because, you know, they've been looking forward to this. And yet, you know, myself as a landowner here on my little plot of ground, you know, I, I don't want to see the rest of the valley with neighbors as close as mine, you know, although we get along fine. But the thing is, when you start doing that, then, you know, developer after developer is going to be looking to this for land. And we really want to kind of maintain some degree of control over what happens to our valley. The village, the homesteads, and the farm lots are just a part of Waimanalo's diverse community. Haleapuni is a new state-subsidized housing area for low- and middle-income families. It looks very different from other parts of Waimanalo, and it's trying to figure out how it can fit in with the rest of the community. Clinton Akana is one of the new residents. The people are striving to remain where they are as far as the economic and social levels. I say remain where they are and move in the upward direction. We don't want to deteriorate and become like uh, old Wabanalo. And this is not a slam to old Wabanalo or Mayor Wright's housing or Kuhil Park Terrace. Many of your new subdivisions such as this become Kuhil Park Terraces because uh, people just don't give a damn. And we want our people here not to have that attitude. In an official Hawaiian capacity, you might say, uh, nobody has ever welcomed Haleapuni here that I can recall of. And I've been president of this association for the last uh, year. We are not isolated thinking people. The surroundings has made us isolated and we're going to continue to be isolated in the eyes of the general public of Waimanalo because I think the general public of Waimanalo has made us so. Contrary to popular belief, the beach lots house more than just a wealthy elite. In fact, it may be the most completely integrated neighborhood in the community. Once envisioned as a beach residential area similar to Kahala, it now holds all racial and economic backgrounds with no apparent strain. Despite the differences in the various communities which make up Waimanalo, these differences have been overcome in making decisions which will affect the whole community. The location of the fire station and the library were determined by the entire community. Al Lewis, chairman of the neighborhood board. I, I believe, although we have numerous factions like uh, um, like I had mentioned earlier, we do have uh, uh, a wide range of uh, views from all the facets in the community. I really believe that um, if we did have um, a politic, uh, a different um, matters and so forth that did arise, yes, that the community would band together and, and support whatever uh, major endeavors that, that did crop up upon us.